Thank you so much, Paige, and welcome everybody. Thanks for coming uh, to our last and final, I guess is it, final uh, Bitcoin for the year, 2014. And um, my name is Tarek Lewis. Um, some of you may know me. I work at a startup called Digital Tangible. <laughs> um, I also have a, a lot of SF Bitcoin devs people who uh, come to the meetup that we host every Monday. Uh, and um, I am graced here with some awesome brains in Bitcoin uh, compliance and policy. Um, their brains are so big, yes, um, if you fill up this room. And um, uh, I'm gonna start with uh, Constance, but just to uh, give a brief overview, um, Elizabeth and I, Elizabeth Stark and I, you know, got together and said we wanted to do a panel um, where we can, you know, the biggest need that we have as entrepreneurs in the crypto space is that we don't live our days um, doing policy and doing compliance. We live our days writing code, building product, acquiring customers, and trying not to die. But um, since you know this is crypto and compliance regulation and compliance is such a huge part of our business, uh, it would be so awesome to have a panel of people with deep expertise to help tell us, you know, sort of give us things that we could take away from the night. Um, if you've been to any of the SF Bitcoin Desk meetup, you know, we always want to be able to do stuff and have people go really, really deep. And this panel is going to help us. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Constance and have her introduce herself. Hi, uh, my name is Constance. Um, I'm a technology lawyer and advisor in the space. Um, I had had the dubious honor of being one of the first GCs in the space of a Bitcoin exchange, um, I guess in these years, relatively early days. Um, and in that process, uh, really became highly aware, acutely aware, and painfully aware of the education gap between policymakers, regulators, and the kinds of, and the, and the companies actually, and the kinds of business models and products and the mission behind their business models and products in the space. So um, through that role, I um, did kind of a world tour explaining these technologies to various stakeholders, both public and private, and in the course of that form, data, which is a nonprofit self-regulatory organization for the space. And so one thing that we've done is to set up a series of workshops um, under with, with in collaboration with academic institutions, the first of which is with Harvard and MIT, a second of which will be with Stanford and Berkeley, and a third with Oxford and Cambridge um, over to get the EU perspective. So in the first quarter of the next year, we're gonna have a series of these workshops, which we hope will be distilled into a holistic policy framework that really translates these legal regimes in a way that addresses the way distributed architecture works and, um, and preserves the benefits of these technologies and innovations. <coughs> Good evening, uh, my name is Alex Fowler and I'm um, co-founder with uh, Blockstream. Uh, and at Blockstream, I am um, focusing on all the kind of external facing functions. Um, uh, but I have spent the last two decades working on technology policy. Most recently I was with Mozilla where I led uh, the policy work. Um, and Elizabeth's nodding because she and I have been through quite a few wars over the last few years, uh, which we'll share some of those stories with you here. Um, <clears throat> and then um, I actually started uh, working in the 90s on export control of mm -hmm. cryptography and uh, that what actually brought me out here to work for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So I have a lot of different relevant uh, policy experience that I'm really excited to share with you tonight and I look forward to the conversation. <coughs> Hey guys, my name is Elizabeth Stark, and uh, my background is also in the intersection of law and technology. Uh, I was at Harvard Law School and the Berkman Center, where I did a lot of work around open source and uh, alternative copyright models and regimes. I then taught at Stanford and Yale about technology policy, and then I found out about Bitcoin and decentralized technology and cryptocurrency and thought, you know, this is everything I've always loved. Um, which brought me to more recently get involved in this space. Um, I've started building technology for micropayments and donations, and then BitLicense came out. And I said to myself, oh, one thing I should mention is Alex and I both worked very closely together on SOPA, uh, the Stop Online Piracy Act that was killed uh, by the internet community, and it was kind of the biggest protest in online history. But was it really killed? <laughs> well, yeah, that's actually something that's this week we're yeah. trying to figure out. Uh, BitLicense came out and I thought, well, hey, I've done a lot of this kind of work. This is a law that's really problematic for this community. So um, together with some friends and entrepreneurs in the, the space, including Austin, are you here, Austin? Austin, okay. Hi, Austin. Uh, I started a group for entrepreneurs called Start Bitcoin. Uh, we, we only really soft launched. We're a group of entrepreneurs um, promoting the future of 
digital currency and decentralized technology. So our goal is to represent the voices of small entrepreneurs that can't hire policy people and that don't have the time because they're busy building their product to represent their interests in this space. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> hello, my name is Juan Suarez. Hello. I'm um, in-house counsel at Coinbase. Um, I actually probably have the least interesting background of all the people on this panel. Uh, <coughs> my background is securities fraud litigation, which fortunately has nothing to do with Coinbase's business. Um, we, uh, like many of you, I actually kind of got bit by the Bitcoin bug uh, a couple of years ago. Um, not at the technical level that many of you have, but um, I found it to be just a really fascinating technology. Basically spent all of my free time reading about it, and uh, that's how I found Coinbase, and here we are. It's been a very exciting uh, ride for us um, recently, and I'm uh, looking forward to a lot, a lot more of a sort of exciting development of the company coming in the future. Awesome, great to meet you guys, all right. Uh, so why don't I get started? Um, I'm gonna start with some you know, easy questions. Elizabeth's gonna jump in and help me out, make sure I you know, get going on these. Um, all right, so first question uh, for the panel. Um, let's get real. Okay, when it comes to crypto policy, who's making good policy? And can you give a specific example of good crypto policy? Well, I think that, um I think the first, um, there's a distinction between compliance and, and policy. So I think that a lot of the immediate need is, okay, where do I fit in within the law right now? What do I need to do today? And that's compliance with the law. Um, so, that's, so I think that there's been a lot of focus on that because as businesses, we need to operationalize, we need to go to market, we need to figure out where we stand today. The problem is that these technologies uh, really disrupt a lot of legal regimes and there are a lot of open questions and lots of time to build. And so, you know, I would say compliance is, is figuring out how to, how to comply with the rules and the policy is really figuring out what the correct rules should be. And the problem is that we're in financial services. So um, there are, the stakes are very high. It's in the most highly monitored and scrutinized industries in the world and regulated industries. So how do you make, how do you bridge this policy and information gap <coughs> in a world today where companies are struggling to figure out how to, how to build a correct world. So I'd say a good example of bad policy is bit license, bit license proposal. Um, it was a rush to regulate. They nearly expanded old models and you know they, they really exacerbated some of the existing problems in online, online transactions and, and privacy issues. So that's an example of bad policy. An example of good policy would be you know some of the, the states and jurisdictions that have either taking a wait and see approach or have very simply defined the way their laws apply today, for example, Texas. Um, you know, provided some clarity as, as to how the laws apply today um, with open questions and development for the people. I agree on the Texas front. Um, for example, Texas has said that cryptocurrency or virtual currency is property, and therefore only when you're dealing with fiat do you have to be, uh, are you eligible for money transmission license, otherwise you don't have to get it. Um, that's drastically different from what we're seeing from a lot of other states. Um, on the international front, for example, I've been in touch with people in Australia, and aside from the taxation issue, which apparently is an issue because of the VAT that's being charged right now and they're fighting this, but on every other front, they've gotten no action letter. So effectively agencies saying, we will wait and see. Will you as an industry figure out how you're going to regulate yourselves? And they're pushing for a self-regulatory oversight model where the industry comes together, they figure out how to regulate themselves and the government will theoretically cooperate. So that's drastically different than what we're seeing here right now in the US. Yeah, I'd reiterate all that stuff. And one of the things I like a lot about Texas is they're not, you know, they're not backing away from existing money transmission statutes. I don't think anybody's asking them to do that. They're saying, look, if what your if what your business involves is money transmission, we're gonna call it money transmission, we're gonna recognize it that way. But we're not gonna say that just doing Bitcoin stuff is money transmission because it's not consistent with our statute. And at the end of the day, that's actually kind of a hard analysis that a lot of states have foregone, unfortunately, because you need to go look at what your statutory language says, and you need to think about the terms, and you need to think about how you regulate this activity. <laughs> so one of the things that I think is helpful that Texas has done, and what I, I saw uh, came out today in the CSPS thing, is that um, you're looking to the activity um, of what the people are actually doing uh, rather than to the, to the technology. Um, if you discriminate against the technology, I think everybody agrees that's bad. Um, if you look at the, the actual activity, I think you can then have a more reasoned policy discussion that makes sense for everybody. Yeah, and I, I would add to this that, you know, I think we sort of focused on good versus bad. I would actually focus on crypto, uh, the underlying technology and the math that drives it versus 
the applications of it in the financial services sector. And I think if you look at crypto policy, there's a completely different set of stakeholders and a completely different set of conversations that are happening right now that really don't know any of you and don't know that you actually are an important stakeholder in cybersecurity policy that the administration's leading. Uh, and I think we're continuing to see advancements around mm -hmm. export control, uh, or refine, refining uh, that law so that we can use strong crypto and software products. Actually, an interesting uh, data point. So 20 years ago, a mathematician here at UC Berkeley um, uh, was part of a, a land, landmark case, Dan Bernstein, uh, that led to a Ninth Circuit uh, uh, ruling that software code is speech protected by the First Amendment. It's one of the cornerstone uh, legal opinions that I would classify as crypto policy, but it's also one of the reasons that we're actually here tonight. If we hadn't had that decision, uh, a lot of the work that we're doing and the, and the advancements that cryptography, strong encryption can play in financial services and so many other markets is directly uh, related to that uh, ruling. So um, anyway. The, so yeah, okay, so what you guys are saying is then ignore bit license, follow Texas, and build a compliance program around Texas. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> Come on, people. Give me something. I have a startup. I just got half a million dollars. Ignore New York. Go for Texas. <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah. Federal, anybody from the feds looking at this, this is just a panel. These are nice people. Look, if you, if you take a look at, at uh, what New York has proposed in the bid license, it, they've defined, they've grabbed a lot of land in terms of what they think they can regulate there. And honestly, um, I think so much so, and there's so much amb ambiguity behind it, that I actually would probably caution people about operating a, a virtual currency business in New York because it's easier to define the exceptions to the rule than it is. So to should we say we should block New York? I honestly, yeah, I'm actually. I would caution. I would caution. I strongly caution. I'll, strongly I'll say. Right, I'll say it. I'll say it. <laughs> um, well, one related thought also to what Alex was saying is, you know, fundamentally, you know, Bitcoin and the blockchain, it's a technology, right? And the currency is the first application. I mean, you guys know this. On top of it, and my fear is that in the regulatory and compliance and policy environment, people are largely assuming that the currency equals the protocol, and that's incredibly dangerous. It's as if you know, email being the first application on top of the internet, then the postal service goes and regulates email and tries to regulate the whole internet or something. So this is something that I'm incredibly concerned about in terms of the future of. Well, well how long are we going to? I mean, how long do we have to wait for policy people to figure out that they are really different? I mean, we're startups. We have a life cycle of maybe two no, years. We can't wait. We can't yeah, wait, yeah, right? Yeah. We can't wait. So um, I'll with New York and with Texas. Well, we have an opportunity here in California. Um, and so we're... Uh, What's happening in California? So we're about. expecting uh, the DBO, which stands for... Department of Business Oversight. That's right, Business <laughs> Oversight. <laughs> I'm still learning all these new acronyms. Um, so yeah, so the DBO is apparently going to be releasing a staff report uh, in December. So I would assume this week, since next week is Christmas. Um, <laughs> but, you know, maybe it happens. Maybe it's a Christmas present from the state of California. But anyway, um, so the staff report will lay out the uh, California state approach for um, how either existing regulations apply to Bitcoin and virtual currencies and anything else that they're thinking about. Um, and that's that's actually all I know. I don't know. You I mean, have no opinions of how you think the California might well, constants? Listen, thoughts? I think California is a, is a unique uh, environment. One of the things that's interesting about California is that, you know, when we look at uh, privacy and security law, right, we have a very different um, approach uh, from a legislative perspective, so the policy side of this, that I think creates an interesting history to talk about the, um, some of the, the, the consumer protection benefits that are inherent in blockchain technology. So I think we have an opportunity in California to maybe change the narrative a bit. So instead of saying, yeah, we need, we need to regulate Bitcoin, it's more like, how do we make the financial services sector as secure as Bitcoin and blockchain? Go ahead. Um, and I think we have an opportunity here to have that conversation, at least that from a you know from a block stream perspective, is how we're going to be approaching that conversation. Right. I mean, right now, um, they, the regulators have a mandate to fulfill. They have a, their own set of knowledge and a timeline, and you know, their entire raison d'être is to regulate and to take the land grab and to figure out how this applies. And the cost of not doing that is that they don't fulfill their policy mandate and they don't get rehired for the next year. So. 
Uh, we have a few models right now of different ways that we can do it. We've got the fit license proposal, we've got Texas's approach, we've got some um, claim, some calls for safe harbor, startup on ramps, um, you know, other mechanisms to allow innovation to grow. So right now, we don't. We, all of these proposals are set forth with many assumptions. One is that expanding the old models will provide more safety and soundness for the financial system. Another assumption might be uh, we need to regulate now because consumers will be harmed. So the, the best thing that we can do right now is for, for us as an industry to address some of these more pressing issues. So if you guys have innovations in safety and soundness, I know there have been some, some innovations in continuous real-time accounting, others that address those policy goals, let's collect them, let's show regulators how we can actually help them achieve those goals better. Um, another would be to, as a pressure point to other, other proposals, actually substantiate how your business may grow or not grow because of these regulations. Because this is, right now, we have these proposals and without substantiation, there's a rush to enact some sort of certainty, some sort of framework. So I want to give a quick yeah. plug to Byron uh, Gibson, who I know is watching. Uh, he couldn't be here tonight. But uh, one night at a Bitcoin devs meetup, I was chatting with Byron and we were talking about how the blockchain can be used to much more effectively achieve the objectives that for both compliance and policy that regulators want to see. And he said to me, Elizabeth, why don't you start you know, a group on this? And I was like, I'm busy, you do it. And then he did, and it was amazing. Um, so there's a group called the Crypto Economy Working Group out of the Institute for the Future, I think you're, you guys are part of it, um, that Byron started and some other folks here are involved with. So I would encourage in terms of actionable steps, um, any engineers or people that want to build these systems, are interested in architecting them, are interested in thinking about the compliance and the policy angles, um, get in touch and join this group because part of this is to both build out a framework and also encourage the development of technology that can make this community better. That's awesome. Uh, okay, I'm gonna move away from policy and I'll come down to a little bit of compliance. Um, one attorney told me, a partner in a law firm, uh, we at Digital Times will have four law firms that we've engaged, it's ridiculous. Um, and she said to me, Tarek, um, you have to know whether or not your compliance program is effective. You can't just say you have a compliance program. It must be an effective program. And I'm like, what's an effective program? I mean, do I have to like, you know, report everybody who does something on our platform? So what I'm hearing is compliance, but nobody seems, not even vendors can tell me, what is an effective compliance program to help? I think what effective, it, like in a nutshell, what it probably is, is you need to know who the people are on your platform. You need to know what stuff they're doing with, the, with their business. Um, so if you've got a guy who's running 4,000 Bitcoin a day through your wallet and um, you have no idea who he is, um, if I was your lawyer, I wouldn't like to represent you when the regulators come knocking because it's going to be a kind of a tough argument to make to them that you've done your diligence. Um, again, that's presuming that you're regulated. So you, the very first step so even before you get to this, whether I have an effective compliance program is to figure out whether you're actually a regulated entity. And that's very complicated thing you've got to do. But once you get through those gates and you establish that you are regulated, at the end of the day, I think it's diligence. So you know, we spend a lot of time um, um, doing diligence on people to make sure that you know, we're not involved in unlawful activity, which is, I think, a, a critical and necessary step that you have to take if, if you're a regulated company. So that's basically what I think of an effective policy is. So I actually have another hat that I wore for about eight years where I was an auditor for PwC doing compliance reviews uh, for financial services companies and healthcare companies and technology companies and so forth. Um, and you know, I think you know, everything Juan said is, is right. You know, and, and we would come in and we'd say, well, it's people process technology, right? And so we would have controls that we would assess for each of those three factors. And you know, over time, what I started to realize is that um, yeah, you can have great documentation, you can have a clear understanding of kind of what's happening on your business, but most of the time when you had uh, compliance programs that were breaking down, it was because of um, inadequate governance and leadership around compliance. You didn't have a culture in that company where compliance mattered. It was buried, it was seen as an overhead, it was under-resourced, the people who worked on it weren't really appreciated or the metrics that they were working to produce around compliance didn't matter to the executive team. And so, you know, I would say 80% of effective compliance in any area, um, but certainly in the financial services sector, is I think comes down to, you know, is this something that's embraced by the leadership of the company? Is it adequately resourced? Uh, and 
Uh, have you thought about the incentive structures of the teams that you have working on different products and services, and are they um, being rewarded for doing the kinds of due diligence and compliance work that they need to do? So I want to provide a brief counterpoint. I recently met with the chief compliance officer of a very well-regarded and very well-known non-Bitcoin company who is ex-military and ex-law enforcement. And I went to him because I was interested in learning more about what can we as a community do for compliance? And what he told me was really interesting. He said that he thought Bitcoin was laughable. And that if every single Bitcoin every day were laundered, it still would be such a small proportion of the amount of money that's laundered globally. And he actually cited a stat that 1% of the trillions of dollars laundered globally are even caught via these programs, right? So that's, that's kind of something to think about. But um, on the flip side, I also, it occurred to me that why, why is there a strike for compliance? Why is there not a good API that will search what's called the OFAC list? So you can see if you're dealing with people that are prohibited by the US government or filing the kind of requests that need to be filed. To me, a lot of this stuff can be automated and in terms of solutions and what the community can do. Um, we're technologists, right? We can build things to, to meet these needs, but I want to raise those. Yeah, um, just to provide some more context on that. If you look at KPMG's uh, global AML survey from this year, the stats are pretty depressing. They are um, really spending hundreds of millions of dollars upgrading their systems every year. They know it doesn't work. The level of attention that AML uh, is getting at the board level is, is increasing year after year. The efficacy by one or two percentage points, despite all the millions pouring in. So, and they even have a little section in the report where they say, you know, if you're heartened by all the return on investment on all of these compliance, just think about your reputation and the kinds of unquantifiable uh, harm that ah. from that. So, so that's literally their, their com note of comfort um, to the effectiveness of these programs. And then I also, I've talked to a few people who, who audit uh, some of these top, you know, non-Bitcoin financial institutions. And what is effective actually is a BSA examiner going in there and testing out your manual, your control, and see, figuring out whether it catches what, what it's intended to catch. So literally it's a few sample size, I mean, the way that I've seen it has been a few sample sizes of catching, you know, certain patterns of many to one, one to many, those sorts of things. And these kinds of, um, stats and metrics are enough to satisfy an examiner that, you know, if, if you have the four pillars met, a training program, a KYC program. You know, well, well, four pillars, what are they? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the four pillars, having an email program, a BSA officer, training, record keeping and reporting. That's basically your four pillars. <coughs> actually, if you look online, if, if you're an operating company, the first thing actually is figuring out whether you're regulated at all. If you're offering multi-state, <coughs> if you actually don't have the ability to spend funds, you may not be an intermediary. That's one of the open questions that need to be really answered is who is really a custodian and account holder in a P2P world, right? So that's one, one major question you guys should answer. And then, you know, if you are to be regulated, the, there are, you can look online, there's a BSA examination manual. And yes, they do not apply all correctly, but they literally have the steps that an examiner takes. And if you can apply that model and, and adapt it to your, your program and you're catching the people that you're purporting to catch and you have a sense of who your customers are, um, you know, that's considered effective. So you have to have provable metrics of catching the appropriate people and your controls actually working. So I gotta catch somebody. <laughs> I mean, right. I well, gotta catch what I mean, so. Somebody's <laughs> gotta go down. <laughs> there gotta be so, one person so in my database. You don't count the other, you know, however many other billions of people you did catch, you only, you only count that one percentage. One percent. So if I said I got one person, I'm good. <laughs> if, you, if, you can, if you can prove that your controls are, are doing what they intend to do, and you have some metrics for that, that's usually what, what's happening. I mean, I'm so, sure Alex is very more colored on that. One actionable thing, we're talking about actionable things in this panel, is I would like a startup guide to AML. You are Tarek's company, and you don't know what to do, and you don't want to spend you know, tens of thousands of dollars on a lawyer, and we want to do this actually with the group that we started. So if anybody's interested in that, please get in touch. No, yeah. but to, that, to that point, um, I mean, we've created an OFAC list checker ourselves. We wrote it. We're going to open source it. Awesome. We don't hear oh. other startups in the Bitcoin space creating tools for third-party systems checking and saying, hey, we have a new list. Let's you know share it. I mean, it'd be nice if Coinbase maybe helped us out a little bit. <laughs> Anybody from Coinbase? <laughs> Brian? Um, but, but my point is, is that um, the reason why I ask is because I feel like compliance is a competitive advantage. If all these people can't do it good and they get arrested, that's good because we're the last ones left standing. Isn't that how this works? 
Um, <laughs> I don't think um, that's entirely right. I mean, yes, I, I think you, you have an, an advantage if you can demonstrate that you, you have a compliant program. And that's important to regulators, particularly as you get bigger. Um, they want to see that you can demonstrate that you've got an effective program in place. Um, but I think this is also, it, it's important to recognize that even in one or two person companies, you know, they can get shut down and they will get shut down if they're not complying with the law. On the other hand, I, at least in our experience, regulators, particularly at the federal level, are a little bit more reasonable uh, in, in dealing with smaller companies. So they'll recognize that you've got limits in terms of what your, what your actual abilities are to comply with these laws. You have to just demonstrate that you're doing the diligence and putting forth a good faith effort. I think this, the, your comment about you know, having compliance at the front of your mind at the, the management level of the company is a great first step. Um, and you know, I think that it, provided you can start to walk down that path, you're, you're off to a pretty good start. Um, in my experience, at the, among the, some of the larger companies in the space, I don't think anybody's looking at compliance as sort of like a, a blocker to competition. Um, I, what everybody's focused on is increasing adoption. Um, and we recognize, we actually all started out as, as people like, like the people that are in this room. Most of, um, most of us came to meetups before we came to Coinbase. Uh, we recognize that the future of the innovation in the industry is in places like this. Um, and I, I do think we want, to, we want to see people like that kind of thrive. All right, okay. Um, now, uh, another question I have was uh, today we saw the CSBS announcement, the Conference of State Back Supervisors. I didn't even know they existed until today. They released a, and I'm, and I'm the compliance officer for my firm, <laughs> and they released a draft proposal on digital currency businesses. Um, again, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm the compliance guy, I'm like, oh God, another. Yeah, yeah, okay, what does this mean? Should I care? Should I say, okay, it's the state banks, stop the press? Um, professional opinions of that announcement today, does it matter? What do you guys think? So this came out today, and I, I'll confess I did maybe a light to medium skim on, uh, on what they said. Nice, uh, nice. Uh, <laughs> so I, that profile. <laughs> I'm not really uh, totally prepared to, to indict it quite yet. Um, one thing I saw they did, this is, I think touches on what we were discussing earlier, which is that unlike New York, they are focused on the activity. I did see that that came through, which is important, and I think a reminder to really ask yourself, what is the precise business that you're offering? Um, how did the funds flow through your business? Um, start with your FinCEN guidance, um, and FinCEN guidance, by the way, is actually pretty helpful. I, I think you should all be reading that. Uh, they came out with further clarifications to the guidance that's, that's extremely helpful in understanding, at least at the federal level, how you're gonna be uh, viewed categorically what, as a transmitter or something else. And I think that if you can understand that, you're gonna, st you're gonna be off to a good step um, with respect to how the states are gonna profitably view you and classify you. Um, and what I like about this report is that they are, they are, like I said, focus on that activity. So understand your activity, understand what you're doing, um, and then move forward from there. Did uh, Coinbase um, provide any insight or guidance to the CSTB? Uh, or CSBS? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, I think we're, we're in conversation with many, with many folks who are involved in that and all that stuff. Because I think you know, that's, that's definitely, you know, if, if I think about this from a policy perspective, right, we've got a lot of different uh, actors who are now interested in uh, coming up with different opinions and different frameworks. Uh, we certainly see it happening at the state level. We see it uh, federal level, internationally. Now we're starting to see other countries. Uh, the OECD has a paper. Uh, the G20 is going to get engaged in this, right? So, um, you know, that's a, that's a, there's a lot of demand in, in a sense for uh, actually thinking about um, what these cryptocurrencies mean and, and what the implications are, how they work from a technical perspective. And, you know, I'll just say, you know, I think there's a, that's a, that represents a huge problem for us. Um, and the fact that we don't have a lot of technical and sci scientists um, engaged in the process, instead we have businesses talking with uh, regulators, I think that creates a, a fundamental challenge. Um, I heard you have a company with a lot of technologists. Yeah, yeah, um, but seriously, I mean, I think, you know, fr from a, you know, overall community perspective, I think this is a, this is a, this is a serious uh, gap in any kind of concerted um, policy regulator education type activity. And, and until we can get that level of, it, of understanding um, and that engagement from the technical uh, community, um, I think we're gonna continue to see sort of half-baked proposals 
proposal staff don't really understand the differences between so what do we do we're, we're here we're technologists i have an idea yeah. okay yeah. <laughs> okay so to, to we stage sopa too yes yeah. <laughs> let's do it um right. Wait, though, so you guys so, say comments work no well no well, well, hold on. Okay, so, so yes and no. Yes and no. Okay. So first of all, I think it's actually about a mindset. It's about changing the mindset of the community. Right now, I fear that we're in a reactive mode. Somebody comes and proposes something, and then we respond, and then maybe they take into account our comments. And that's not how we win in this community. And people are also, I, I fear, a little bit too deferential uh, to either lawyers or regulators, and I have a lot of grief, so. Um, and that's, that's not the future we want. Uh, what we have here is fundamentally different than what came before, and that's why it's so special, and that's why we're all here today. Um, so to me, it's actually a, a change in mindset about this. It's not just saying, okay, we'll take the regulations that apply to banks, even though our technology can achieve these goals in you know, far more efficient, you know, better, cheaper fashion. We, we need to rethink the way that we're doing policy in this space. And it's early, and in, in many ways, Actually, you know, the internet didn't even have to deal with a lot of this in, in this early phase. And by the way, there are two, um, you talk to me about this after, I can go over this for a while, but there are two really important uh, internet laws, two safe harbors, the CDA 230 and DMCA 512, which effectively meant that websites were not responsible for the actions of their users. And those enabled the trillions of dollars that we have today. So as to what we can do, um, with Start Bitcoin, we're proposing a series of safe harbors for both CSBS and bit license, um, so we're about to get people on board, but for things like startups, so an on-ramp type thing, multi-sig, um, people making decentralized currencies, they're issuing, control, controlling, or administering, um, and also for micropayments, because that's something that our technology can do that credit cards don't do well. And the idea that you're sending 10 cents or 10 Dogecoin or something, and you have to be regulated with millions of dollars in bonds makes absolutely no sense. So that's one thing we can do. When is that coming online? What, what, what are your next steps? We, we are currently drafting it, and we're going to put it out to the community, so talk to me if that's of interest awesome. to you. Awesome. So actually, that's also what the workshops um, at Harvard and MIT and at Stanford and Berkeley are intended to cover as well, is that you know we have these business models are our new paradigms, and they do not fit into the regulatory boxes that we have. So the question is really, instead of, kind of having them come up with proposals and de facto expansion of their model, um, for us to really be able to proactively change that conversation to what should the world look like instead of how are we going to try to prove how your world doesn't apply to us? It's a very different question and it has, it's a very different conversation. And so, you know, there are technologies being deployed today that enable people to verify. I mean, I know BlockScore is one, um, there's another, um, you know, there are ways of being able to verify trust and identity on the internet without collecting PII, and people are doing that in marketplaces very well. So where can we kind of put together all of the knowledge from the technologists, from all these decentralized tools that we're doing, and kind of marry that with the, the public policy goals that these financial rules are intended to cover, and actually have a framework that addresses the way the technology works. And so the next two months, I think, are very critical. So we have a lot of open proposals. We, we all know, um, you know as, as professionals, as entrepreneurs, as technologists, that these, these regulations don't make sense. But in the absence of substantiating why that doesn't make sense or why we have an alternative framework, they, they have a momentum to push for regulatory certainty. And so, um, you know, you've got a few, you know, again, a few models that have been proposed. California apparently can come out with one soon. So, you know, as, as comments are elicited in the next two months, I think it's incredibly important for us as a community to really think about how a policy framework should look like instead of how their policies don't apply. So I want to actually ask a question then, yeah. um, which is, I think the first, the, the way Bitcoin unfortunately came out of the scene for a lot of regulators was through Silk Road. Um, and uh, so the first regulator to react to that was FinCEN, which is the, the body government that's responsible for anti-money laundering. Um, how do you think you affect like a, the paradigm shift you're sort of talking about with a regulatory body that is already very skittish, um, that is dealing with the technology that's decentralized, it's hard for them to understand, and which has unfortunately some track record of some illicit people on it. Of course, I mean, I mean FinCEN's director has, has acknowledged that the cash remains the preferred method of choice and blockchain is really transparent, but that's not an argument that gains traction. So, um, very good question, and I think that we need to really define as a community who are financial intermediaries in this world. What constitutes a custodian account holder? What really, 
at what point is a customer really liable to their consumer and, it, and at risk to a financial network? So that's one. So we need to distill the business models that don't apply. Uh, the other is how do we as a community, I mean there are a few companies more and more developing every day and amongst us we handle all these transactions for different Bitcoin entities and companies. Surely there must be some way of being able to, um, you know, in this decentralized world, there are platforms being, you know, created right now, there are web of trust, reputation ratings from other marketplaces, other, other tools that we can use to, to verify trust without collecting PII at every point. So if there's some way of, for example, one, one way that might work is a decentralized, um, a decentralized zero knowledge proof way of being able to verify whether someone's on an OFAC check without collecting their documents, right? If you could have some way of being able to do Unicorn. that. <laughs> In a way that can't be reconstructed by anybody and that any access which would be, would be completely transparent on the blockchain auditable. Right now, all we have are stories of how money is being laundered, we have stories about how we need to prevent this, and we have stories about how it works but nothing substantiated. So I'm actually, I, on that note, I actually think the answer is a bit different. I think it's a PR answer. I think it's a marketing answer. And it's saying, let's get articles out there about remittances, about the underbanked, about charities, about all these positive things that this technology is doing for the world. Let's talk about blockchain-based technology that goes even beyond the currency aspect. I've talked to high-ranking officials and governments, and they've said, Bitcoin needs to be this positive thing that when people think about it, it's not, oh, Silk Road criminals and really you know, negative things. It's something that has hugely positive transformative power. So it's up to technologists to build these things. It's up to the community to support them. And then even something, uh, write a blog post about it. Put it on Hacker News, put it on Reddit. Get op-eds um, in different publications, right? So to me, if what politicians and regulators are reading is no longer about Silk Road, but instead about the positive uses and how this can and is transforming the world, then we can change this narrative. Okay, so that's great. I want it, but I have a three months of runway, um, possibly six months until my next funding round, and um, I don't have time for all this stuff. Um, I got to get more customers. I got to make sure Coinbase doesn't steamroll me, because <laughs> they're going to raise a big round soon. Um, we're in a race um, as startup entrepreneurs and, and many folks here. Um, you know how. How can we be effective to achieve those goals when we have the pressure of do not die, stay alive, and we can't afford all this other awesomeness? And, and of course, we still have to wait till the, 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 the regulars finally understand the science. What, what do we do? So you're not alone. All right. Uh, actually, you I mean, a block stream, right? Yes. So you mean I have 21 million too? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, for sure. Uh, I'll pre-mine it. There you go. Um, so you know, I think that the uh, um, so yeah, there there are actually a number of groups that are starting to get a uh, lot savvier about uh, Bitcoin and blockchain technology um, that already have well-established uh, lines of communication with policy makers and regulators. So you have CDT and EFF, both um, are ramping up and getting more engaged. Uh, they were very active in the bit license discussion. Uh, you've got Coin Center, uh, the digital, uh, digital Chamber of Commerce launching, Bitcoin Foundation, uh, you know, a number of different groups that uh, have the ability to uh, unify uh, concerns in the community and bring those to policymakers. So I would say your first step is Share your story, share the frustration, share the challenges, so that those are those are, you know, nuggets of gold, nuggets of Bitcoin uh, that we can that we can use uh, to Give really. Me some yeah. <laughs> okay. Gold too. That's right. <laughs> um, but I mean, seriously, those are those are really important anecdotes that um, resonate, uh, and uh, you know, because these are because you represent jobs, you represent uh, that you're entrepreneurs, you represent the American dream, right? That you're creating something new and right. So we have to tell these stories and we have to be able to share those with, um, with state uh, policymakers as well as regulators. So, you know, I, I would say really the first step is understand that this is not something that you can stick to your head in the sand and ignore. Right. This is something that is real. Um, and engagement today matters. So um, just take one group, like go to the EFF, join and say, I'll tell you one story. Like yeah. just 
yeah. you know, descriptive, get it in there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So a lot of you guys are companies with three month runways, building products in a highly regulated space. So all of you guys don't have money to do this, but collectively we have power in numbers and there's a lot that we can do. So I encourage you to speak, um, you know, really get, get, your, get, get the information out there, join one of these groups, um, co provide collective mind share to the work that we're doing and, 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 and we'll make it happen. Also for the technologists, and there are many here, um, Use your skills to build things. For example, with SOPA, some of the most powerful um, tools were built by the developer community. Um, they were in reaction to the really bad law. It became a meme, actually, and people it got retweeted, and people made tumblers out of it, and they were, there were the blocking kind of interstitials on sites, and all sorts of Mozilla ended up doing that. People blacked out their logos. It really kept spreading. Um, similarly, if there's you know, a law or proposed regulation that you either don't like or something you do think could be better, you can build tools around this and you can put something out on the internet and, and have it go viral, right? And if, if you're in that situation where you got three months of runway and, and, you know, six months of operations ahead of you, um, one thing you could do is that you can actually contact your regulators. You can, you can take two days. Well, you can talk to these people. Yeah, you can. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sometimes they're actually pretty receptive to it. Uh, you can take two days and put together a letter describing your business and you know find your cousin who's a lawyer and get them to take a look at it and you know they'll actually pretty frequently i think be impressed with that kind of an effort hold on a second now i wrote a letter they haven't responded to me yet right well it, and then the, the nice thing about the letter is that in the event of, that an action does come you can then point to that as a, like a prior disclosure of maybe that <laughs> helps you um, but you know i mean there it, it is tough it's very tough i mean do you well so here's the thing we wrote a letter we haven't heard anything. Do, do we go do bang we? on their doors? Do we go yeah. say, hey, listen, I'm camping out your office? Did, yes. did you write a letter in New York? Or? Uh, we did the FinCEN thingy, Majiggy. You tell oh, FinCEN oh, that you're in business, and <laughs> FinCEN wrote us a letter saying, we'll get back to you. Yeah, one of the things about, um, one of the, the problems you will run into is that these guys don't just regulate the Bitcoin space, they regulate the financial services. Wait, space, it's right? more than Bitcoin? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so um, you know, even, you know, like, we're, we're a relatively big player in the Bitcoin space, but we, we don't get our calls returned right away. I mean, we have to call them five times, and we have to send them two letters, and it's actually kind of irritating. But that's what we do, because that's how we, you know, get the level of communication we want to have. Um, and I actually think it is viable for a two-person company to take a couple <laughs> days, write a letter, and do a few phone calls. Um, put it on your calendar, schedule it, you know, every other week for the next two months and see if you get traction. Treat it like a drip marketing. Sure. That's it. Drip marketing for regulators. Love it. Oh, the other thing, um, with respect to your steam <laughs> comment about Coinbase, uh, <laughs> you're going to actually have to work really hard. And I'm, I'm thinking about our founders. I mean, they were basically two guys uh, working at a company that had 300,000 um, customers and they spent six hours a day doing support tickets and then they had to spend the other rest of the waking hours you know, building the business. So that's inevitable. Uh, you are going to have to work really hard, um, but that's just what it is for, for I think, young companies. That's awesome. Uh, you know, I want to come back to something you said about FinCEN. So um, I was talking with another large, well-funded uh, Silicon Valley startup to their head of compliance after the recent FinCEN in November. And he said, you know, whoa, this new uh, advisory scared the crap out of me. We don't know how to deal with it. It had seemed that FinCEN had broadened their you know sort of range of uh, control by saying that now anybody who was doing any sort of uh, you know money transmission blah 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 you know I think this was the one with the um, <coughs> yeah uh, they were trying to do credit card processing was the Bitpagos um, one yeah. Bitpagos and so he was saying you know we're well funded and now we don't know how to treat this um, was the last advisory really oh and by the way the banking advisory stuff. Did that hold any teeth? They, they sent out that last one where they said banks should not discriminate against companies. And yesterday I was at a bank that said, we don't care even if you say Bitcoin in the right corner of your website, we're not doing business with you. I mean, yeah, it's hard are to they help helping? Yeah, it's, you know, banks are, not that I'm gonna be an apologist for banks, but I mean, the truth is they've got an avalanche of regulation and de-risking and fines and enforcement actions coming down on them on the one hand and they got one guy writing a letter that says hey you should be friendly to Bitcoin companies right so that's not gonna actually change the behavior um, what's what you have to basically convince a bank I think that you're a compliant company 
um, before they'll work with you. So that's how do you do that? Um, honestly, you have to you have to do the things we've been discussing. You have to have a team. Well, we've had banks tell us that no matter what you do as a Bitcoin startup, you could never be compliant the way we want you to be compliant. Because to be the compliant the way we want you to be compliant, you just can't afford it. Yep. So don't bother. I mean, honestly, I don't I don't really have a great answer for you because banks are extremely skeptical uh, to Bitcoin right now, and you know I think. I think we, others in the industry, are trying to are working very hard to come get get them to come around to this technology. There are some forward-looking banks that will bank you, but um, it's tough. I mean, it really is tough, and you are going to have to do these compliance things if you're going to want to have a bank account. I mean, that's the that's the bottom line. Is it true the rumors that Coinbase and their bank simply live together? Like you guys are not just bros. Like, uh, you have coffee together every yeah. morning. Not quite, bank. but I, I think it's fair to say that you you will. You have to anticipate a very close mm -hmm. working relationship with any financial partner that you have. They accompany to the. Okay, good. <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, all right, yeah. So I've been, we've been talking a lot. Um, you guys have been here. Any questions? Uh, we're going to get a mic runner. Yeah. We have one question coming from the founder of Swarm. So um, I'm curious since I know. Uh, I've been on a startup thing. I really appreciate your stuff, Tariq. And I know that um, one kind of question, I'm curious how people perceive this were up on the panel, but um, within the venture capital industry and investment in different types of startups, it seems like the legal work ends up kind of siloed. And this is true of you know, many things about Bitcoin, but siloed within one particular venture capital funds you know, portfolio. And there aren't really a lot of good opportunities for a kind of collaboration um, around different people doing different kind of legal work. And I think. I'm curious, particularly for those who are available, sort of knowledgeable about kind of crypto ledger systems or you know the 2.0 technologies. If you see any way to use those um, to enable kind of more legal research that sort of benefits everyone at the same time who's involved in the ecosystem and participating in those things. And in particular, I'm thinking about things like um, intellectual property, like for example patents and things like that that can be licensed um, to the people who actually participate. I'm curious if you see this as a you know potential way of making some collaborative progress on some of these legal issues that it seems like so far we haven't. And, and I think that's directly relevant to this Harvard summit as well. Can can you just are you suggesting that people get patents in this space? Um, well, I'm actually referring more just to legal research. So you know, for instance, no action letters or you know different kinds of things where basically the product of the of the legal research are something that's made available um, to members of the community. Um, and I think there's a lot of different areas in which that could be applied, but um, you know, all of these kind of regulative um, aspects have a kind of similar feature set. So. Uh, yeah, I think the CDEWG does some of that, right, currently? Yeah, first off, I just want to say I'm not a software patent, so hopefully I don't want software patents uh, as much as we can avoid them here and big fan of open source. Um, as to your broader question, I think this gets back to Constance's work and about collaboration, about really coming together as a community and not thinking of ways of innovating in law as proprietary per se, but saying, hey, actually this will benefit the entire community. You know, Coinbase benefits when there are more people using Bitcoin and more startups out there. And, and you know, your company benefits by Coinbase benefiting, right? So we can think about it that way. They're really, we're really at the fraction of, of what this, this market can look like and what verticals this can disrupt and, you know, what applications you can really find. So, you know, this, you know, we're really, really here at the very beginning. So there's a sense that, you know, there's a race you know, as you mentioned, to, to compliance and go to market here. But there are some common issues upon which we all rise and fall as one. You know, one would be the application of USA money transmitter rules and others. So, uh, you know, to the extent to which, you know, we can collectively as a community answer those questions in the next two months instead of individually trying to spin this out in our resources, doing it over the next two years, um, you know, in, in disparate fractured voices, I think the better off that we'll be. Uh, now, the problem, of course, is that, uh, you know, not all business models are the same, your co competitors in, in the space, and I, I really encourage people to take a very broad view that, you know, if we want user adoption to be where we want it to be in two years, if we want, you know, all of our companies to get the market, market share that we think we can, um, you know, that, that it's really important, actually, to invest a little bit of time in making sure that the rules of the road are right now, instead of fighting the next five to ten years of rolling back bad rules that expanded data surveillance um, regulations across many different industries so I think the next few months are really actually very critical for collaboration and so 
we as a community, we can solve many of these issues. We can figure out, um, you know, APIs for better monitoring. We can figure out, um, you know, different ways in which we're increasing corporate governance, reducing liabilities to consumers, allowing use, addressing the usability gap between the technology and the users. Lots of things that we can do. So, uh, you know, I just, you know, there, there, there is a sense that there's a market. Everyone's kind of looking over their shoulders, looking at what the people are building, but we're really, really at the very beginning, and there are many things that we can do as a community that would really expand the different markets and opportunities and applications of this. So really, I would say take a broad view. Let me just give really two quick two quick resources. Uh, one, go read Coinbase's con uh, comment letter to DFS. We did a ton of legal research there. Um, it was very in-depth. Um, we did it because we think it had to be done. It's, it's, I think, a good perspective on how money transmission laws work. So do that. The other thing that I think we can all do, uh, just really kind of a simple thing, is you can re request comment letters and you can allow them to be made public so that uh, your administrative agencies, when they take a look at your business, um, they will allow others to kind of take, take this as a guide. So I think it's reasonable to say Coinbase, Coinbase would commit to like allowing these things to be public um, to the extent we get these sorts of letters. And um, I, I think everybody should try and do that. And in fact, so in some cases, the law requires it anyway. Uh, so I, I've actually been asking that same question as I've um, been getting started here with Blockstream and looking around at the different organizations that are engaged. And, and I, I do think we need we, there is some work that needs to happen to build better unity within the community. Um, I have to say, and I don't know if this is how this is going to play here, but I'll just put my perspective out there. I've been very surprised with the, the, the infighting within the community. Uh, the, the trolling, the negative comments, like I see a lot of, I see a lot of factions fighting and that really doesn't help when you're trying to go and have, you know, a dialogue with incumbent financial services companies, with regulators, right? I mean, we kind of look like we're unprofessional boobs that really shouldn't be given any time uh, to talk about these issues and I think that's a real uh, mistake. So, you know, I, I think we, we have some serious soul searching to do if we are going to come together and create resources that are shared where we can start to have a more uh, productive, engaged dialogue about the policy and regulations and how they impact our sector, we're going to have to deal with some um, you know, real community building as an open source community. Amen. So there's been a lot of you are. Oh, my name is Ryan Singer. I'm a prominent entrepreneur in the legal system. Um, so there's been a lot of um, th there's been a lot of media circus around all of these policy recommendations, um, both from the companies. You know, some companies are like, "Screw you guys, we're going to Iceland," or is it? It's not Iceland. It's Isle of Man. Right? Isle of Man. That's right. Um, and then you know, some companies are like, you know, we're, we're eager to comply. We're an American company. We're following American rules. And there's that whole thing in between and everybody's filing these questions with regulators and these notes and stuff like that. But where the rubber meets the road, the part of my business that has to be in the US is the part that banks in the US, right? So the people on this panel have worked with a lot of the companies in this space that have had a lot of their own banking negotiations um, with perhaps the prominent exception of, of the special relationship between us and Coinbase. Have these policy uh, suggestions, have these conversations, have these compliant, the evolving compliance regimes, is it making a difference? Is it easier for startups to bank than it was when I took my 30 banks to the FDIC? No! Yes, so banking relationships remain um, the most problematic, some of the most problematic things in this space. Um, you know, we are trying to re refashion the financial system, and right now the, the main highways for that are, are you know, largely locked out. And so right now it's on a case-by-case basis where you have to really go to a bank and uh, convince them of your, your team, your product, your mission, your backers. It's a very personal, very uh, selective, very difficult process. But okay. has anybody even succeeded? People are six, yes. People are getting bank accounts. Are you sure? You, well, 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 American <coughs> companies are getting bank accounts. Bitcoin American companies are getting bank accounts. There are there are a few. Yes, there are a few. Uh, wow. so, but this actually points to the importance of raising the common floor of the industry. 
So this is not a, it's not even a regulatory issue, it's a perception issue, it's a PR issue. It's are these companies, good companies, responsible companies, um, building products and services that are useful to society. But then why do we hear about them? If they're, if they're yeah. getting it, why don't we know who they are? Well, I think that people are keeping that. But then, then that's not PR. Because if you can't say we've been successful. So I mean, the PR of the industry. So, so rather than PR of a specific company lending the name relationship, rather the, the industry itself being able to posit itself as a, as, a, as a responsible, reliable part of the global financial network or you know, other, other, other networks. So that story is what, what kind of needs to be refashioned here and, and that's gonna take a lot of work from the community. I, I thought I heard an, a special exception for Coinbase, so I don't think I have to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm honestly, the, the, the short answer is, look, I mean, it, there is, it's not easy for us either. I mean, we, we have to go to these people and we have to do, again, all the things we're talking about. We have to establish that we've got a compliance program, that we have these people, that here's what we do. And it's, a, it's an ongoing burden, really. Um, and for now, there's, that's not, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. It's going to be hard for us. Um, what I can tell you is Coinbase is one of the, I think, it's fair to say, a few leaders that are trying to smooth things over with banks. Um, I think we're doing a pretty good job of it. But um, yeah, in the short term, it is going to be tough, uh, which is, I think, the short and honest answer to your question. I, I want to bring this back to Alex's point, though. This is an example of why we have this attitude in the space when you have some companies that say, yes, we've got banking, and they can't tell you because they don't want you to know, or their bank will get in trouble, or they're just all out lying. They haven't told their bank, but real business. Or you have Coinbase, which is like, listen, you know, they fought hard for where they're at, but SVB is not talking to anybody else. I mean, for all the fact that they are doing this business, um, you, it seems to me that this is a natural, the, the defensiveness and you know, the trolling of the industry is, an, is a, essentially an outcome of this type of, well, some people can get it and some people can't. And so you know, we're all sort of sneaking around each other. And I feel like you know, it's a disease, one feeds the other. I, I don't know if that helps explain a little bit. Yeah, no, I think there's a lot of uh, deep-seated mistrust um, that fuels a, a lot of the um, kind of community challenges. And um, yeah, until we can actually work through those, right? It's got to get a shrink or something. Yeah. <laughs> but until we work through those, I mean, I think it's, it makes it you know, challenging yeah. to, to really deal with these issues. So. And also, we're here in the US, but let's remember that there's an entire world out there and say, for example, FIDO in Germany or banks elsewhere around the world that are working with these companies. So it is in our collective interest as a community here in this country uh, to figure out ways to work with banks because otherwise there'll be companies elsewhere around the world that'll compete. And, and granted, we want a community to come together, but here in this US community, we can lose out if we're not able to get these banking relationships. So the one thing about banks is that yes, we, we live in a little bit of a bubble here and we think we're the center of the universe, but there exists a universe beyond the United States. And um, actually banks are, act I have clients um, who are banks that are actively looking at the space, seeking to integrate some of these different FinTech innovations. Barclays just had a distributed, secret distributed bank summit um, in the UK uh, recently on how to integrate these technologies. So they're, they're starting to think about it. And you know, there's an opportunity actually to if we can build a policy framework that makes sense, if we can figure out you know, amongst ourselves how we're dealing with some of these issues in the open source platform um, with, with different P2P networks, there's an opportunity to really influence policy elsewhere, which drives policy here. So if we can drive policy in the UK, if we can drive policy in Luxembourg, in Australia, if we can use these as models for why this framework actually works better than their old closed shop proprietary framework, and all of a sudden you have a race to the top for a country to have the best balance of innovation, of, of, of regulations, and, and banking relationships will follow that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of moving pieces here, and so it's, it's easy to say, oh, banks, 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 but actually the bank issue is a perception issue, and it's a regulatory issue, the right framework issue. So addressing those problems will solve the bank problem. All right, we have a few more. I could we take one more question? Um, the young lady. Do we have a runner? Do I have a mic runner? Sorry, Dana. Sorry, I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Um, besides FinCEN and state regulations, is there any other? Are there other regulations such as UCC that startups should be paying attention to? 
I think it probably depends on what your business is. So if you're like lending Bitcoin to people, then the answer is yes. There's probably a whole lot of other things you'd be thinking about because what you're doing looks like deposit taking and lending, which is like a bank, right? Or if you're gambling, um, then what you're what you're doing looks like a regulated gambling activity. So um, setting aside the substantive stuff like that, um, I think that if you can, um, you know, dot your eyes and cross your T's with respect to the FinCEN guidance, and then dot your eyes and cross your T's with respect to the money transmission laws in the state where you're located, you're probably off to a pretty good start. One of the cool things about Bitcoin is that it's so many different things to so many different people. Um, for example, um, with a lot of the 2.0 tech, which is a big interest of mine, we have, say, prediction markets. Is Jeremy here with Augur? Woo! Um, or, you know, Joel and the folks working on the I'm not going to call it crypto equity, sorry, I just said Bitcoin that. Bitcoin 2.0. Sure, sure. The idea that you can fund, you know, new forms, you can have DAOs and DACs and Ethereum and all of that. Um, so, in terms of Bitcoin 2.0, it's, it's really incredibly early and it, it pains me. For example, I am a big fan of Counterparty and they actually were removing features, not from the protocol, but from, I think, any of their implementations because they were, I believe, afraid of uh, a lot of these policy and legal issues. And my response is, A, it's very early and I want to see people innovating and then I want us to be able to craft the policy such that we can do all the really cool things that this technology can do. Um, I, we're a Bitcoin 2.0 company. Um, we've been both talking to FinCEN and the SEC um, because what we do could be perceived as uh, securities. Um, to the point spoken here, uh, Regulators need to be educated. We know that even the SEC has 50 state regulators as well as the federal. I mean, it's just amazing. You have to talk to these people. So if you're in Bitcoin 2.0, I would totally recommend having some sort of SEC discussion, CFTC discussion, because uh, they need to be educated. Last word, anybody? Last words. Okay, so last words from our panelists, starting with Constance. Next few months are critical. There's a huge opportunity in the information gap. We can do it. I'd say next year is going to be the year that Bitcoin policy and regulation uh, really takes off. Think of policy as something that we as entrepreneurs can shape and we can make the future that we want it to be. Um, I don't have a snappy one, so I'll just say uh, <laughs> work hard. You're gonna, I think if you work hard at this stuff, this is a really exciting space. You can do really well. That's how we got started. That's how a lot of you are going to get started and become really big companies. Our panel. Thank you.